Welcome to My Life, because it is supplied episode 112. Let me begin by wishing everyone a kosher and a and Pesach, as well as a uh, meaningful Yud Aleph Nissen, which is coming this Tuesday, the Rebbe's 114th birthday, and Yud Gimel Nissen, which is coming on Thursday, the 150th Yard site, Stalkus of the Tzemach Tzedek, which we will be speaking about. So consider this a uh, special Yud Aleph Nissen edition of Chassidus Applied. And as well, in honor of Yud Aleph Nissen, we will be announcing the second annual 2016 winners of the My Life Chassidus Applied essay contest. Um, and we're focusing, of course, besides Chassidus, on Rebbe, being used to Yud Aleph Nissen, Tzemach Tzedek, and a few other related themes. So let me begin in order. Let's begin with Yud Aleph Nissen. Yud Aleph Nissen is coming this Tuesday, the Rebbe's birthday. And of course, there are many questions people ask, especially today, when you don't see the Rebbe Begashmius, what is the significance of honoring this birthday? And what is the personal relevance to ourselves? Now, some people don't have this question because the Rebbe lives in their lives, the Rebbe lives in their beings, whether they're shluchim or shluches, or they are, whatever it is they're doing, they feel inspired, they feel like they're the arms and legs of the Rebbe in this world and continue to do their mission as they were inspired by the Rebbe. But there are many people that do have this question, and even for those that don't, we all can use inspiration, we all can use ways to grow. So there's so much to say, and uh, if you have to choose some type of topic. So let me begin with uh, a few uh, interesting things that I've uh, found in my journeys. And I'll refer, number one, is to an interesting uh, letter. I'm sorry, Sicha. In the day of Yud Aleph Nissen, when the Rebbe became uh, 59 years old, I'm sorry, 49 years old, Tavshin Yud Aleph, which is the year the Rebbe was Makabal in the CS officially. Of course, the Stalkus of the Tzapfridic Rebbe was Yud Shvat Tavshin Yud. Yud Shvat Tavshin Yud Aleph, the Rebbe formally re- received the leadership, assumed the leadership. So this is Yud Aleph Nissen a few months after Shvat. So the Rebbe says, oil that day, he asked that this should be given over in his name. So it wasn't a sikh actually, it was given to the secretaries to be given over in his name. And this is the beginning of the Rebbe's 50th year, the 49th birthday in Tavshin Yud Aleph. He says, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just translate straight into English. He says, all those that want to say, Ibi Gibn Zich, those that want to dedicate themselves and folgen to listen to everything I will say to them without asking questions, should sign their name on a note with their num- name and their mother's name. Those that sign should not be afraid. The Rebbe says, They don't have anything to be afraid because we're not going to be demanding from them a level of that they have to climb to heaven. But on the other hand, they should know this is a serious thing, not a joke. The Rebbe said. And you have to fulfill your promise and your commitment. When they gave the note to the Rebbe with all the names of people who signed this commitment, the Rebbe said, again, this is a serious thing, even though we won't be demanding you to do the impossible, basically climbing to heaven. Whatever was said, Yud Aleph Nissen, Tavshin Yud Aleph, applies to every Yud Aleph Nissen, and there's maybe no better way than the Rebbe, in his own words, what we do, Yud Aleph Nissen. It's a total dedication and a rededication to what the Rebbe asks of us. The Rebbe being the Nosi Hadar, the Moshe Rabbein of a generation, carrying the message from Hashem to the shlichus of the, our particular time. As the Rebbe so powerfully demonstrated through the years of his leadership and continues to demonstrate, applying the ideas of chassidus, of teireh, that come, go back to Har Sinai, and of course chassidus that goes back to the Baal and the Magid and the Alter Rebbe and all the Rabbeim, into the Deir Shvi, into the language, and to the needs of our generation. So Yud Aleph Nissen is the perfect time to rededicate and commit and a serious commitment to listen without asking questions. That's what commitment is. Now you could say Chabad is about asking questions. Nasa v'nishma. Of course it's about asking questions in the, with the purpose of internalizing and understanding it. But part of asking questions is also part of the tzivu. It's also the command that we should understand as elokus and the divine will should also be integrated and internalized into our lives. So that's one the letter from the Rebbe, uh, this is also Tavshin Yud, a little earlier, 
of Yud Aleph El, El. It's printed in Igris Kedish, the Rebbe's letters, page Tovchaf Aleph, 421 at the bottom, and continues on the next page. The Rebbe's writing, apparently, to someone that had problems, a detractor, with, with the Rebbe, and he writes, that which you asked me about people giving me pedianus, pedianus are the notes and the brakoshes that requests that I should read them on the tzion, on the Friedrich Rebbe's oil. In other words, he's questioning, why is the Rebbe doing that? So he says, number one, this question you should ask by those that are giving, not by me. Number two, it happened to be that even the Friedrich Rebbe's lifetime, pedianus were given to me to pass on to him. And number three, he writes, that uh, what you're asking, that through this I am uh, absolving people, the ones who are giving me these notes, from Hirhuri Tshuva, thoughts of Tshuva, and from pouring out their tears, the Rebbe says, I never thought of that. And at times I see it as an explanation for the giver. And at times I connect it with the fact that they're writing it with a promise that the giver, the giver of the note, that is, will commit to something of Teirah and Mitzvahs. And we've seen, thank God, Teirahs, fruits, from the many, many who have committed to their commitment to, to add and increase in Teirah and Mitzvahs. So God forbid, it's not about absolving them, it's on the contrary, it's to increase. Then the Rebbe continues, and this is the real thing I want to focus on. B'chol Mechtov, says in your entire letter, with, apparently with all these complaints, so to speak, you, I don't see at all that you should mention what you're doing in, in, in influencing others and bringing them closer to Chassidus and to Iskashus with our Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rebbe the Shver, the Rebbe says. The Rebbe says, Moshele, 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 What's an example? A king that gave somebody and put them on Shechem, on their soul shoulders, a certain responsibility. And that person, instead of doing that, is doing something else. Which, in, which of course causes him to diminish the time and his concentration and focus and what he's supposed to be doing. Then the Rebbe continues, it says, the Rebbe Rasha made it clear that the Tmimim, the students in Yeshiva, are neres lohoyer. Their job is to illuminate. And he goes, wherever they go, their job is to, to um, and the mission that was given to them by their teacher, by their Rebbe, even Alpin Nigla, the Rebbe says, I'm not going to go through all the details here. And the Rebbe says, of Mposhen Loshen Geret, Simply put, as in the mort, in the place where he's found, where he exists, where he is, he has to make sure that it gets illuminated, because that's the mechus v'tafkid. This is the, pers- the the essence, essence, and the purpose that his soul came down from Igre Rama, from a, such a high place to such to this low uh, valley, this low pit, to call the world. The Rebbe continues in, obviously, the city where this person lives. In this and this city where you are, are thousands of Jews. They don't know about Chsidis or about the Rebbe. And those that know, and even though those know, don't know how you should know. When I eat from the elder Tmimim, and I drew from the, from the older students of the yeshiva, who received so much from the Rabbeim, is saying, thinking, what do I have any relationship with them? Anyway, this is a letter I think every one of us should read today, tomorrow, Yeralf Nissen. And basically the Rebbe is showing him that he, instead of writing to me complaints, what are you doing? You should be doing the mission that was given to you. So after the Rebbe gives him in a respectful way a response, I thought this is a letter that's both a wake-up call and we all need to be shaken up at times. It's a good letter to take personally, everyone in our own way. So that's the Yeralf Nissen few points I wanted to make. There are many other things to say about Yud Aleph Nisan, as I say, it's endless. Every year was a Fabreng, and especially after Tov Shon Lamad Aleph. Before that was not every year a Fabreng, except when the Rebbe turned 60, which was in Tov Shon Chav Beis, and Tov Shon Yud Beis, and the Rebbe said, my morning I'm based on the Kapitlach of uh, that year. And obviously after Tov Shon Lamad Aleph began Fabrengans every, every year, and for tremendous Fabrengans, the Rebbe speaking about Nesias, about leadership, his role, and so on. I will add one more thing that I had discussed in the year Shnas Hashmenim, Tavshim Membeis, when the Rebbe turned 80, that we had suggested something to the Rebbe to publish in honor of the 80th birthday. And the Rebbe said he doesn't have time to be Magia, the, the, the Maimorim. We were suggesting all the Maimorim the Rebbe said in Yonal of Nissen. And the Rebbe said, instead, be Matsiya something that I don't have to be Magia. Suggest something that we don't have to be Magia. 
which is a rare schus that the Rebbe should actually tell us, suggest something. And we did. We came back with a consensus, talking to several different people of uh, an idea, which the Rebbe then converted and said, it should only be a kevitz teirani, which became kevitz in Alf Nisan, ve'eid ve'ike, that's when the Rebbe wrote, on the note that I wrote to the Rebbe, that the, to publish a Tanya, and that Tanya the Rebbe gave out that night, all night, shnas ha'shmenim. So people, birthdays in the world, receive gifts, and the Rebbe was giving gifts, which of course is a far more uh, appropriate thing to do on a birthday. And all night the Rebbe gave out these Tanyas that were special Tanya with all the Tfusim, the Sharblatlach, the covers of all the prints of Tanya everywhere. And the Rebbe detailed, maybe 30, 40, 30 lines, wrote out what kind of Tanya it should be. That was all part of after the Rebbe, after we suggested, the Rebbe said, suggest something. We suggested, and then the Rebbe said, do that, but, and, and primarily do this Tanya. And that's another Yudal of Nisan thing. So Yudal of Nisan is the birthday of the Rebbe, the day the Rebbe's Neshama came to this world to fulfill the shlichus of the Dei Rashvi, and by extension, and essentially, our birthday. Because the birthday of all shluchim, of all chsidim, of all, chsidim, of all shluches, of all of us who see ourselves connected to what the Rebbe represents, which is the whole Dei Rashvi, and we'll talk about a Rebbe a little more shortly. And, but that is essentially what Yudal Fnis is about, is making that deep connection. Now, when you add to the fact that Yud Gimel Nisan is two days later, and the Tzemach Tzedek, of course, the Rebbe's direct lineage from the Tzemach Tzedek, besides the same name of the Tzemach Tzedek, and, uh, and, and many different similarities and commonalities. So Yud Gimel Nisan this year is special because of the 150th yard site. How do we know it's special? Because of the 100th yard site, the 100th year of the Histalkus in Tavshin Chavvav, 50 years ago, the Rebbe made a big tumult about it. And at the time, the Rebbe, the Rebbe spoke about a number of things. There was a Fabrengen, special Fabrengen with Tzoyi Shabbos. Yud Gimel Tishrei that year, I'm sorry, Yud Gimel Nisan that year was Sunday. So Mitzvah Shabbos, early Yud Gimel Nisan, the Rebbe Fabrengt. Besides, there was obviously a Fabrengt that day, Shabbos HaGodl, Yud Beis Nisan. And there was also Fabrengt, Shabbos Mavorchim Nisan. Three times the Rebbe said the Maimar HaChidosh HaZelachem, which is from the last Maimarim of the Tzemech Tzedek. Printed today, we have it printed in, uh, let me just give you the actual source. It is printed um, and Eira Teira Boy, page 264. I'm mentioning it specifically because the Rebbe asked them that people should learn the Maimed on Yud Gimel Nisan. So clearly, if it was relevant then, it's relevant today. And now we have all the three Maimedim from the Rebbe, Avach Hedish HaZalachem, explaining that Maimed from the Tzamech Tzadik, in addition to the Maimedim in Tafresh Nun Dalad, Tafresh Chavov from the Rebbe Marash, Tafresh Nun Dalad from the Rebbe Rashab, and Taf Shin from the Fridik Rebbe, all uh, annotated in the, in the Maimedim of the Rebbe. So the Rebbe said the Maimah Shabbos Mavorchim Nisans, Pasha Sachedish Vayakab Kudeh. He said it Pasha Tzav, which was the second time, which was Yud Beis Nisan Shabbos Agodol, and said it Mitzoyi Shabbos. And it's interesting, when did the Rebbe say the Maimah Mitzoyi Shabbos? If I bring it started after Shabbos, he said it exactly 12.37 at night. 37 minutes after midnight, 12.37 a.m. And because that was the time when the Friedrich and the Samach Tzedek Sistalkos take place. The Rebbe brings there a Rishima that says the Estalkos was the eve of Thursday. The year of the Estalkos was Thursday, like this year. The eve of Thursday, Yud Gimel Nisan. Th- 37 minutes after, and the Rebbe writes that it's cut off after what? So it says after a certain hour, after midnight. But it could be any time after midnight. Later, the Rebbe says in a letter, he cites a note from a story that it was clearly 12.30 after midnight. So when you have 37, 12.37 was the exact time of the Histalkus, and that's when the Rebbe said the Maimon. Similar thing happened with the Rebbe the, in the year Tavshin Chav Gimel, when it was 150 years from the, from the Alta Rebbe's yard site, from Tov Kufa in Gimel. The Rebbe also fabring that Mitzvah Shabbos, like it was Chav Dal Tevis, and also during the time when the Histalkus happened, that's when the Rebbe said the Maimon and so on. So, in addition, a few other things that are interesting in that, that Sikha Mitzvah Shabbos, which was a made of Fabrengen, the Rebbe spoke about the Tzemach Tzedek and his godless. He spoke about the greatness of the Tzemach Tzedek in many different ways, and um, especially about his encompassing Kola Teira Kula. Now, interesting, there's a, um, in the year, also in the beginning, the early years, before we get to the, the hundred, hundred years, in the early years, Yud Gimel Nisan, Tavshin Yud Aleph. Again, the same year. Two days after the Sikh I read before, Yudal Vissen, Tavshin Al, the Rebbe told Rabshmul Levitin 
to daven for the Amid. And after Maidav, he told me Shafa Brink. So Rabbi Shmuel Levitin said that his father, Rabbi Shmuel Levitin's father, was by the Histalkus of the Tzemach Tzedek. And that Bashas Mahit said that the, the, the Maril, which was the Tzemach Tzedek's oldest son, was not in Labavish during the Histalkus. When he came to Labavish, he said, Maril said, Azar Rebbe is Nachnit Given. Such a Rebbe was never. From his line, you can make an entire Maimer. And the Rebbe Marash responded, Not just from a line, but a feel from a word. And the Rebbe then spoke after Rabbi Shmuel told the story. The Rebbe said, es is a hein rav. The, the, the Tzemach Tzedek's works are a tremendous amount. And the Rebbe said, I didn't yet go through it all. Or you could say, Durgitan, even more than go through it. Durgitan means uh, struggled with, uh, exerted myself. Or Durgitan really got out of it with it. Exerted, uh, how, I'm not sure how you translate Durgitan, to be honest. Many of it cooked. I only glanced through it. Not worked it through. From the amount that I did go through properly, is every footnote, every gloss, is a tremendous amount. Hein Rav is like a tremendous treasure. And the Rebbe continues to speak about a bunch of, about different elements. Give some examples. And you can look up the Sichets again, Yud Gimel Nissen, Tov Shin Yud Aleph. And they talk about a little more about the Tzamech Tzedek and so on and so forth. But I think it's a very tremendous sikha to look at. In addition, going back now to Tav Shen Chavav, when it's a hundred years, so the Rebbe began the Fabrengen then and said about the Tzamech Tzedek's uniqueness was that he wrote so much. And yet, not like the Alter Rebbe or the Mitle Rebbe, which most, a lot of it was published. The Tzamech Tzedek in his lifetime was not published and even right afterwards it was not published. The Alter Rebbe, uh, the Tanya of course was published, Tere, Lukut, the Tere was afterwards. But the Mitla Rebbe was a tremendous amount was published. Tzemech Tzedek, so much, and nothing was published. And the Rebbe goes into a whole adichas about the Tzemech Tzedek's uniqueness of bringing together Nigla and Chsidis and Remez and Drush and Medrish and so on. To the point that the Chsidim had difficulty after the Mitla Rebbe being able to absorb the Tzemech Tzedek's style. Because whatever he said, he said, right, I'm saying, Doya Medrish. And then he said, Doya Gemara. And here is a Zayar. And here is a, uh, another, another uh, Sefer. Because he connected Kola Teira Kula. And that Fabreng, which is a fascinating Fabreng to read and learn, especially this week, the Rebbe brings a few points I'd, li- I'd like to just share, which is, number one, is about the fact that the, the Tzemach Tzedek was born, of course, Erev Rosh Hashanah, Tovkov Memtes. They, the Alta Rebbe said that Rosh Hashanah, which would be a day after the Tzemach Tzedek was born, he said the three first, Mashbi and Esei, Maimorim, which became the three first chapters of Tanya. And the Rebbe, in a fascinating way, explains how the three chapters of Tanya, the first three chapters, all connected to the Tzemach Tzedek. And obviously because the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe, was saying it at the time when he was just born. Besides the Mashbiyan Esai of a new child, the Rebbe says, you see there, he brings first Tere Sheb he brings Tere Sheb he brings Zeya, he brings Raya Mehemne, and he brings uh, Eitz Chaim. Exactly what the Tzemach Tzedek did. And you don't see it in other parts of Tanya, that concentration of so much from all parts. Then he talks about everything. He talks about the Jews and he talks about non-Jews. And he talks about the world. Everything in the first three chapters. Because it, it, it signifies what the Tzemech Tzedek was all about, encompassing it all. And the Rebbe said something even more powerful. That as a result, he says, that's when I was writing the letter, the Mikht of Klali, that year, Tav Shen Chavav. So the Rebbe wrote a letter, like he would do always before Pesach, sometimes one letter, sometimes two letters. So this is printed in Chelech Chavdal of Igris Kedish, page Kuf Vav 106. So the Rebbe says, when I wrote the letter, and I was, and I was thinking what order I should write the titles on the, on the Tzemach Tzedek, the Rebbe wrote, the titles go like this. He says, a Rebbe, but that brought together so many things from Nigla and Nistan and so on, and the titles the Rebbe writes the following. Um, that the, 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 the Tzemach Tzedek was, let me find the exact Lashon here. The Hechst Madrigas, from Tzadik, Gon, Cheker, Mekubal, Pesach, Umanig, Yisrael. What order I should write it? So I based it on what I see in Tanya. The first thing starts with being a Tzadik. Then comes a Gon, learning. Then a Cheker, then he became a Mekubal. Then a Pesach, and Umanig, Yisrael was when he became Reb. So you could look all this up. It's a very fascinating Sikha, but a tremendous way of connecting the Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzadik. There's a lot of hints to that connection between the two. 
And the letter that I'm quoting here, page Kuvav Kuv Zayin, the Rebbe continues and speaks about this Samaritan's all-encompassing nature, which we all know that Rebbe is the same thing. So you all of this and you gimel this and come together. And the Rebbe says um, a very interesting thing. He says, Chosh, who can compare to the Tzamech Tzadik in this regard? The the personality of a true Tzadik and leader is to leichten and leichten, to illuminate and to um, make things illuminated and to influence his keiches, his powers to everyone. So anyone who wants to follow his paths Viderizike Zun, and the Rebbe continues, like the great sun is reflected and, is, and makes illuminated even a small drop of water. So, even a small drop of water, which means we're not the Tzamak Tzaddik, but if you're a small drop of water and you want to go in the Tzamak Tzaddik's ways, you reflect the great sun, which is the Tzamak Tzaddik. But the Rebbe makes the three conditions. Ebnard that Trab Vasir is rain un klor un givendet un givend to the Zun. On condition that this drop of water is rain clean, clear, transparent, and directed toward the sun. Which this itself can be a tremendous discussion. What is the three things? Rain, of course, meaning a clean, not a dirty piece, uh, not, not uh, smudged, but a clean water, clean drop. Clear, that's transparent and not in any way opaque and so on. And it has to be directed to the sun, meaning it has to be makushar and connected to the Rebbe. A drop of water can be great, but if it's not directed toward the sun, it will not reflect the sun. So this is the letter from Yudalf Nissen 50 years ago, and connected, of course, to the 100 years then, and now the 150. And the Rebbe brings there also from the Tzamech Tzedek uh, that uh, the Maimer HaChedosh Hazel Achem is connected, of course, to Nissen, and the connection of Nissen to all the Rabbeim from the Tzamech Tzedek and on. Tzamech Tzedek Yud Gimel Nissen. And the Rebbe Stalkus, and right away, Vizorach Hashem is like the Tzavor, the Rebbe Maraj became Rebbe that day. Bez Nissen is the Stalkus of the Rebbe Rashab, and the next day, and that same day came the Friedrich Rebbe became Rebbe. And without saying as much, Yudal of Nissen. So basically, Nissen, which is the Reish Hashon of the Melochim and the Siyim, as I mentioned in the previous episode, is connected to Rebbe's. We say the Nasi every day in the famous Sikh of, of Yikra Tov Shem Amzayin that talks about the Nitzchis, the eternity of the Nesim and what they transmit to us. As long as we are clean, transparent, and directed and facing the Rebbe, facing the sun. The Rebbe also brings there the famous story with the Tzamech Tzedek that when he went to Petersburg, even though it was a Sakona in danger, and they asked him, how could you put yourself in danger of all the, the people what, what, dependent on you? And he said, firstly, there's children. And secondly, the Achdus from Chsidim Vel Nudurk Trogen will carry us through it all till Mashiach. And the Rebbe uses the word, the expression, the Sikha, Yud Gimel Nissen, that night, Mitzvah Shabbos, he says, so today he says, on Kegan, he says the following, he says that today there's no children, which some take as a hint to the Rebbe is now in having children, so we're left with the fact that Chsidim and their Achdus will carry us through to Mashiach. I think the lesson of that is, speaks for itself, what the power of Ardus, which of course goes right into the, the drop of water to be clean, transparent, and facing the Rebbe needs Ardus, because anything that's opposite of that is definitely not a clean and transparent and facing the sun type of drop. So these are some tidbits, some pieces. I hope you look it all up yourself and you can study it. It's excellent material for your Alphness and for your Gimel Nissen. And, um, and with that, let us move into the discussion about it, some questions asked about the Rebbe and his relevance to our lives today, and so on. So, <clears throat> but let me just add one more thing before we go to that. So the bottom line summation of all this is that Yeralf Nissen, um, even though it's 114 years from the Rebbe's birthday many years ago, and it's uh, 21 years from Gimel Tamos, and, and the Semach Tzedek, it's 150 years since his Istalkus, Yet, as the Rebbe says, it doesn't matter. The Nitzchis, the eternity continues, lives on through, through us. And it's what we do. And we are the drops of water that can reflect their will and their power and their guidance. And that's our responsibility to rise to the occasion and be exactly that for this, as the Rebbe writes in that letter, for this your neshama came down to earth. Think about that. Not for anything else. Your neshama came down to earth to fulfill the shlichus, 
that Hashem gave you, which the Rebbe tells us what that is in our time. That is why you are here on earth. That's the Yudal of Nisan message, the Gimel Nisan message. Now, let's go into, a, uh, into some questions about Rebbe. So I want to just refer to episodes 20, 21, 22, 23, 41, and 107. Those were other times I spoke about Rebbe, connected to Gimel Thomas, connected to other specific significant dates. But that's, so think of what Rebbe we're discussing, supplementing, uh, maybe some, there'll be overlap, I'm sure. But the key thing is that those episodes carry a lot of material. So whatever is said here, please look there for more on this topic, which is, of course, a huge subject with Rebbe. Question one. We learn in Tanya, chapter 2, that a Rebbe, Reish B'nai Yisrael, Rebbe is Rosh Hatevis, Reish B'nai Yisrael, the head of the Jewish people, of the children of Israel, isn't optional. We learn in Tanya that a Rebbe is not optional. It's critical. As an Ashama Klolis, as a central, or you can say a general, a central soul, the highest and sustenance, the sustenance of the entire generation is transmitted through the Rebbe. Why then do we see many pure Jews who aren't chassidim and don't necessarily have a conscious connection to the Rebbe, yet seem just fine in their Yiddishkeit? Is the Yiddishkeit compromised because they don't foster their innate relationship with the Rebbe? With the Rebbe? And how do they receive their chayis from the Rebbe when they don't have that direct connection? Is it something negative? Okay, very good question. And let me answer it with, um, it's hinted to somewhat in the Tanya, but even more directly, there's a famous story. They say with the Magid, they say with the Beis Yosef, uh, either it happened a number of times, but the bottom line is that once the Magid of Mezish said a Achidush in, in, in learning, the Talmidim were extremely excited and extremely impressed and extremely blown away by the Achidush, by this new innov- innovative idea. And they were sharing, and they came back to each of their town. They come, one of them comes into a shul. He sees a small group of simple Jews studying, that Gemara. And the, one of the people says the same chiddush that the Magad said. So he was completely disturbed, completely overwhelmed. Here the Magad said a chiddush, and they were big Talmud Chacham scholars, and they knew it was never said. And here a simple Jew is saying so they asked the Magid, what does it mean? So he said, the Magid said that once you posach, the Rebbe brings off in posach, Chassidus brings in Tafresh Ayin Ches and other places, posach Rab Shimon, posach in Zoyar. And the Gemara doesn't say the word posach. The posach is psiches at sinir. It's like opening up a new channel. Once a new channel is open and it draws in new energy, which is a new idea into the world, in the Avid Elam, in the atmosphere, so then it becomes easier for anyone to, pay, to walk that path because it's been opened up even though they may have consciously not heard it directly from that teacher. So you could say a similar thing. When the Rebbe is Mam Shekha Rebbe, a Nosi, Neshama Klolis, a Tzadik Hadar, is the, is the source of sustenance, like the central nervous system of the Moyach, as he says, that brings the energy to the rest of the body, to all the other parts, it doesn't necessarily mean always that everyone's aware of it. Even in the human body, one has to know whether every organ is conscious. Probably they are in some extent. But the bottom line is you, the, the Hamshachah could still happen and still being transmitted even if people aren't aware and it's absolutely sustaining them. So the fact that there is Yerushalayim, the fact that there are Jews who may not have a direct connection either due to the fact they don't know or for whatever other reason that the Rebbe writes in the letter, even those that know, questions how much they know. There's more to know. So let's not assume that just because someone knows that there's a Rebbe or met the Rebbe that they're already on that level where they have the total iskashas doesn't matter whether you know or you don't know, or what level you know, got, the connection is there. Amoyach is mam is to every part of the body, whether the body knows it or doesn't know it. Now obviously, if you're conscious and aware, it makes the connection stronger, and it therefore also makes the, the Aveda stronger. Like anything, or the Eyam Muna, or Meish Rabbeinu, was mam to his to his people. Sheishu Salofim Ish, an Eich Biragli, as the Pasuk says. The Moshe is drawing energy into everything. Not, they, sometimes they didn't know. As a matter of fact, some of them actually mocked Moshe Rabbeinu. And yet the Chayas, the energy still goes to them, as he explains in that chapter 2 in Tanya. And obviously, if you're conscious, then you're able to take benefit and, 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 um, and channel that connection. Just like when a person, God forbid, is, let's say, a part of the body is not so strong, if you're able to reconnect and draw energy from the central nervous system, from the mind, from the soul, which is the place, the seat of the, seat of the soul in the mind, that makes a person only stronger. So even if someone doesn't know, if they knew of the Rebbe, and they connected through Chassidus and to the Rebbe's directives, their Aveda would definitely be in even a higher level. And as we know, it's only Yelcha Mechayel, Ochayel grows from state, level to level. Question two. 
Dear Rabbi Jacobson, I would like to believe that the Rebbe is aware of our triumphs and struggles in serving God. Is there a source of chassidus for this idea? Does this only apply for those who feel connected to the Rebbe or to every Jew? Well, as I just said, whether we are aware or not aware, a moyach is mam shechayis to the entire body, meaning here the entire nation, entire people. That's number one. So this source is chapter two in Tanya. Is the mind aware of every detail that the body goes through? Absolutely. Now in awareness itself, there you can speak about two different levels. You can speak in awareness that the mind is aware in general, but the you still have to notify so-called the Rebbe of your activities. You can't just rely that the Rebbe is going to use his Ruch HaKedosh and Nevoah or whatever it is. So on one hand, a Rebbe dresses up in, in Levush HaTeva, in the garments of nature, in the garments, and he asks you a question. You can say, what does he have to ask a question about my situation? Why is he asking me how it's going? Why do I have to write to him? Because we have to do everything in this world in ways that are natural channels, firstly for us. And even for the Rebbe, there's an element of Das Tachten. Like we speak about Elikus even. There's the divine das, das Elion, which is divine perspective. God knows, all-knower, and omni, omnipotent, and all-knowing God. But there's Das Tachten. There's God how comes down Eredonah. Siddhis speaks Eredonah. The Debeshter says, let us descend and hear the cry from Zdoim, which becomes the basis of Pasach al the Maimon, and and Tere Er. And some fundamental concepts in Chassidus, the idea of itself, why does the Abish have to go down? Doesn't he know from above? Because there's a being being slaps and relating to us. Him relating to us on our terms and us relating to him on his terms. Here's not the place to go into detail, but similarly you could say the same thing with the Rebbe. There's a Das Elyon, but there's Das Tachn, and that's where we really want to engage with the Rebbe on our terms. Not just that the Rebbe on his terms has a knowledge. So I have no doubt, yes, that if a Rebbe is a Rebbe, he has knows of the triumphs, and those of our challenges. But the more you connect, the more you say to the Rebbe, I want, my, I want you to give me strength, I want you to give me direction and guidance. Obviously, then it's also in a das tach, not a miraculous way, but even on our terms, and the Rebbe's answers will be very tailored to an individual based on their situation. And, and that's why we have to write to the Rebbe very honestly, and you can't say, I rely on the Rebbe will figure it out. He will figure it out, that's not our issue. But we have to figure it out. We have to have a connection on the level that we can communicate. To just assume there will be a Das Elyon is not the approach that we can depend and rely on, even though it may be there. And this is true for something that feels connected and not feel connected. The most important thing to remember, a Rebbe is not an charismatic individual that we're connecting. We're not talking about a cult figure. We're not talking about a personality. We're not talking about, God forbid, a demagogue. You're talking about Mitzias of Bittl, a transparent channel that his entire life is dedicated to the Ratzon Hashem, Isha Lekim, a divine person, so you're not connecting to a person. You're connecting to the divine because through a transparent channel that we can relate to because it can speak to us, can relate to us as an Hashem Beguf. Even today, we can relate to the Rebbe because the Rebbe left us on a tremendous amount of non-nafshik of material to read, to study. So understanding what a Rebbe is, which itself requires learning chassidus and applied chassidus, applying that is relevant today as ever because the Rebbe's directives are the directives of Hashem through which means that he's a transparent channel of carrying the, God's mission to us for this generation. So the more one becomes that drop of water that I mentioned, that reflects, the more you reflect that power, which is really divine power, which of course answers the question which I addressed back in those episodes. We're not talking about the Rebbe, God forbid, in any way. There's only one God. Everything else is a channel for that godliness to come to this world, a transparent channel. Question three. Is it okay for us to believe that a Rebbe can make a mistake? Um, I'm not going to tell anyone what's okay, what's not okay, but if a Rebbe is a Rebbe, he can't make a mistake for the reason I just said. Because, because if not, then he's just another human being, and then it's a transparent channel of the divine means he's gotten his ego out of the way, his personality out of the way, and Hashem works through him. Now again, this needs to explanation. Chassidus, Panim B'Panim, Tafresh Nun Tes talks about the Mamutsa Machaber, the transparent interface, and other explanations given in many different places. And it's absolutely not heretical. It's based by Yaminu Ba'Hashem B'Meisha Avde. Meisha was that channel that God chose, and every generation is a Meisha. In that sense, no, he's infallible because of the divine power with him. Not because as a human, of course, every human being is a human being, but you're dealing with someone that's completely dedicated to the divine cause. And the Ebershter will not allow a nichshel 
a, a, uh, to happen, a kishon, to happen through a person that people are relying on. Life and death issues and so on. Not because of the Rebbe, because the Eivishta, again. Because God chose this person, and if, he's, if he is that, then God will not allow, because he's, you're dealing with life and death and issues of, of matters of high gravitas that affect people's lives. Now, you start talking about Das Tachten. The Rebbe has a Neshama Baguf, just like he could have a uh, sciatica, God forbid, or uh, other things that we know that the Rebbe have a physical illness. Some people say, why can't he maybe also make a mistake? But the difference is, you know, Neshama Baguf, so his body definitely affects him. But we're not talking about the Emes, or what the Ebrister wants him to pass on to us. That's a very different story. You can't compare the two. And I don't know if how much more is needed to explain this. If there's someone needs more explanation, go to Mashpia and discuss it further. What are the differences between types of letters to the Rebbe? Why are there such rigid guidelines for personal expression to the Rebbe? Um, well, for the simple reason, as I said before, when you're writing or you're going to Yechidus to the Rebbe, as Chassidim would spend months in the times of the Alter Rebbe to prepare to go in, or writing a letter, you're dealing with an- entering the Holy of Holies. You're entering your soul. Yechidus is called personal audience. Private is Yechida, Yechida meaning Yechida. Now, we all know to be able to reach Yechidu in a world where you live in a mundane world, a pedestrian lifestyle, shallow, superficial, we're not even getting into worse than that, to prepare to meet your Yechidu, your essence, doesn't take, it's not easy. It's not just a simple thing. You write a little note. It takes uh, soul searching, introspection, sweating, and really being bearing your soul to your own essence. Because through the Yechidu, through the Yechidu connects to the Yechidu of the Rebbe, which connects to the Yachid Elyon, the Yachid Elyon meaning the divine, as I've described. That's the brief answer. Now, there are more questions, but because time is limited, I will leave the other questions for another time, follow-up. I want to address two very important questions, and that is, is there a change? In the, is there a change? Has the Rebbe's role changed today? The answer is absolutely not. I don't have an explanation for Gimel Thomas, and I can't tell you why and what and when. And I don't know what the, what, what the significance of it is. But Emes is Emes. We say Moshe Rabbeinu. We speak about Moshe Rabbeinu. Teres Meisha. Zichra Teres Meisha Avdi. We remember Teres Meisha. And Moshe is thousands of years ago. You could say, well, why are you mentioning Moshe? Just call it Teres. Moshe is not here anymore. Because there's something about the trend, the teacher, the quintessential teacher that continues to teach us Teres, and there's the Moshe within us, as the Altarev explains in Pedic 42, Membez in Tanya. There's a Rebbe within us, the Moshe, and that's the Moshe of our generation. So that role of Rebbe that I'm talking about is a role that has nothing to do with Neshama Baguf. Obviously, if it's in a body, it's more relatable, and we can relate to Das Tachten, as I said, and so on. But the, the, the core essence of it, and the lessons and the teachings that the Rebbe said till Mesh, will lead us till Mashiach, have given us directives. There's no change in that. The change is in our attitude and how we see it. It's harder today. And maybe more of the Bukayachatzma, you need more of your own initiative, more of your own effort, because you don't have the Rebbe lifting you up necessarily in the most revealed way. Unless you lift yourself, then the Rebbe responds. And the second question is have we implemented the Rebbe's vision? Well, very clear that the Gul is not here yet, Amit is Vashlema, that the Rebbe's vision is not implemented, that he stated Yudshvat Tavshin Yudal of Basilagani Deir Ashvi Vishachanti Bisechel. This will be the generation, first generation of Gula, last generation of Golas, first generation of Gula. Which leads me to the next question about Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Neich. In the 80s, even though earlier, but in the 80s especially, the Rebbe began speaking about Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Neich, which frankly has not really yet been um, integrated into the regular process. I mean, the Futsu Manasech and Chutzu could also do more work. But Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Neich, so a question arises, Dear Rabbi Simon, I love your talk, Shiurim. Although I don't have the time to listen to all, I listen to most. The Rebbe asked and begged her that we spread Sheva Mitzvahs among non-Jews. Based on the Rambam, Seif Peter Ches of Hilchus Malach, end of chapter 8, the laws of kings in Mishnah Teda. He stressed the importance of spreading awareness of the Sheva Mitzvah as a precursor for the coming of Mashiach. Yes. I'm looking for a practical directive. In my town, I'm involved with the police and fire departments, and it's a great platform for encouraging Sheva Mitzvahs. What practical steps can I take? I'm looking for clear direction. Thank you. Well, this is not just to you, to everyone. The fact of the matter is we live in a world today, it's very clear, we don't live in a shtetl, we don't live in a ghetto. 
both in business and commuting, dealing with doctors and lawyers and professionals, were constantly interacting with all people, Jews and non-Jews. The Rebbe made it very clear, you're interacting with them anyway, so why not introduce something spiritual, something divine, something godly? So very simply put, I'll speak in first in general terms, and I'll answer your specific question. Wherever we have the opportunity, Jew, of course, and non-Jew as well, talk about purpose. I mean, obviously in a way that doesn't sound like you're preaching, it doesn't come across as uh, condescending, in a friendly way. You know, get, get, guide the conversation to something meaningful. I mean, this may be self-serving, but many people give my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, to anyone they meet, Jew or non-Jew, because it's a universal book, that presents the ideas of Chassidus, Teirah, the Rebbe, to anyone. That's an easy thing to do. But the point is not the book, the point is the message. The message is that we are, Neiris Lohoi, the Rebbe said, wherever you go, you have to illuminate. So for you, firstly, you have to have the mindset that you're there to give, to share, to inspire, to stimulate. And secondly, what are you stimulating with? We're told what it is. The plan that God has for each of us. You just have to find words that doesn't sound like I'm telling you what God wants of you. That's not the way to say it. You start speaking, you speak about family, you speak about personal aspirations, you speak about your own challenges. You try to create a conversation where you can, uh, where a person will open up a bit without an agenda. You're sharing. We're all on the same journey, in the same boat. You'd be surprised how people will respond if you do it in a very kind way. It'll create deeper relationships. If you don't have a lot of time, say, give me your email, I'll send you an email thought. I'll, 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 but, you have to, but you have to feel this is your responsibility, not that what is most mainly gave, like the Rebbe said in the letter I, I cited earlier. As far as uh, uh, fire department and police, look, these are social servants who serve people. They sacrifice their lives to help and protect, protect us. That's a divine mission. Share something about that. Maybe find something, an article, about the value of how they are serving God's mission in this world by protecting and helping protect innocent lives, people who are in danger, the fire department does, the police department. So there are many ways to, to, to strike up a conversation on this matter, especially that if you want to even go further, maybe find a day where you honor them. You live in the city, get a few people together, honor the police and fire department and introduce not just that they're doing a social service, but they're also this is God's mission. You're messengers of God. And make sure to use it as an opportunity to awaken that all of us have to be in some way policemen and fire, firemen, hopefully all for the good, only to help, not just to protect from negative things. But it's an excellent opportunity. So that's a brief answer to those questions. Uh, to do again to time, and there's a lot to be left to do. It's left to announce the winners. Um, so I am going to do now is um, there's a little feedback. Let me do a, a little feedback of a few things from previous episodes. Okay. Number one regarding surrounding children with kedusha. Seeing the type of topic of exposure, I thought to share with you a piece I once posted at the Dan's Deals forum after someone suggested the Rebbe's shita was to send us out to the world since exposure was not a concern. The following two paragraphs were suggested by someone. Interesting how the Lubavitcher Rebbe sent young families, including impressionable young children and rabbis, to assimilated places in the 1970s and 80s, to locations such as Hawaii, Las Vegas, Sweden, Thailand, to build new open schools where their own Hasidic children would be blended into classes with not necessarily Shabbat-observing, kosher-keeping students. The key was to always be above the crowd and to be the teacher-influencer instead of being taught-influenced. It takes strength and constant learning, and yet it's possible to be raised in places like that and remain of Yasef in our generation, and stronger than if we had remained in a 100% orthodox environment. This was my response. The same Lubavitch Rebbe begged for TVs tossed out of all Yiddish homes. He also wanted all, all toys and books containing Tomei animals, impure, in the name of Svarim and Mukabalim, concerned for even the fetus inside a pregnant mother's eye exposure to non-Tahar animal forms. The special case of his authorized representatives cannot be representative of his approach to secular exposure because those individuals' parents were carefully handpicked and the Rebbe himself lacked, looked after the chinuch of these families. My father, for example, born and raised on Shlichus in North Africa during the 50s, endured third world schooling conditions, but the Rebbe personally followed his learning progress and regularly made modifications to his studies via written correspondence 
all the way through his yeshiva years in Paris and beyond, eventually placing him in a position among his own editorial staff. That was the kind of personal interest that Rebbe took looking after the chinuch of families and placed out there. Therefore, such a unique chinuch situation cannot be used to infer, generalize, and claim his derech was to unshelter. That's simply not true. P.S. In the Sicha, as I recall, the Rebbe does caution not to upset the child by taking away his toys, etc. I.e., not on the cheshman of Shalom Bayis, Yotza Scharabe of Seideh, I'd also point out from personal recall of childhood in the 80s how, these, how those children who bullied and hurt others were all from homes with television. I know at least a few of their victims who today are far over the derech. Of course, this positive, positive correlation is pure speculation without all available information. So there you have to, my take on the matter of exposure to Tuma and perhaps why the Rebbe fiercely opposed Limude Chel, secular education. Well, with all due respect, um, even though it is true, of course, the Rebbe protects his shluchim, but he wanted everyone to be that way. And I do not think the Rebbe said shluchim could have televisions in their home because he's protecting them. So I think that's a, it, it, it's incorrect to make this distinction. And I say it very clearly and openly. The Rebbe gave everybody the mission of this generation. This is the mission why we're here, is to influence. And that's the best offense, best defense is offense. Everybody. That's not a contradiction because that's the whole point. If you're an influencer, you don't bring into your home the things you're influencing. That's not the point. So it's not like shluchim, or they're there out there because the Rebbe's protecting them. Everyone else has to insulate themselves. Everyone has to insulate themselves. At the same time, be out there and teach. Little children also grow up in Chabad houses. And so I don't, I'm not sure there's a distinction between shluchim and non-shluchim. Yes, it's true, and people choose to follow what the Rebbe wants. Obviously, they'll have more blessings. But the Rebbe blesses everybody, but the Rebbe wants everyone to be in this position. So I don't want to get the wrong message across here with that. Okay. Um, okay. Another follow-up um, is Chol uh, of Israel feedback. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, firstly, thank you for your wonderful weekly class. My life is supplied. I would like to make two points regarding Chol of Israel, which you were addressing in last week's class. One, the questioner you were addressing brought up that a woman who does, does the cooking and shopping may not want to take on the stringency of Chol Yisrael when her husband might want to. It should be noted that Chol Yisrael is not a stringency. It is the din, it's the law. Chol of Stam is a leniency if not a specific heter. It's a leniency, not a, uh, a, a, a loophole. Uh, if, if not a specific heter. People have misconstrued the concept and, how, and, how, and now people who adhere to the Iker, Hadin, are viewed as being stringent. Because of people mis- misconstrued, that's why they, they, absolutely. I guess this is similar to when Yechen and Kohen Gadol enacted the laws of Demai because people became lax in separating mice. So if you're familiar with that, that they, he enacted Demai because people became lax. So then people start thinking this is maybe optional, but it's not the case. Number two, in regards to cheese, you mentioned in passing that the laws of Menhagim of Chal Yisrael are the same for butter, cheese, and chocolate. I think it should be pointed out that the cheese has an additional stringency that it needs to be gvinas Yisrael. Right. A Jew has to actually add the rennet. Okay, so points well taken. I have nothing to add, nothing to comment on that. Let's go over to the Chassidus question, then the, then the My Life essays, and then the uh, great announcement of this year's win contest winners. Chassidus question. We find that Jewish philosophical books, like Amunas Videis, from the Rasag, Rapsad Yugon, Meri Nevuchim from the Rambam, and the Kuzri from Yehuda HaLevi, present proofs for God's existence. Why don't we find the same in Chassidus Chabad? Since Chassidus is all about revealing godliness in the world and cultivating our relationship with God, why doesn't it begin with first offering proofs for the existence of God? Excellent question. I should qualify and make the stronger, maybe the question even stronger. There is a Sefer Hachkira from the Tzemach Tzedek, which he actually cites the Munas Bedeis and the Meir Nebuchim and the Kuzri and all the other Svarim, many Svarim. But that Sefer was specifically written through the Vikuchim, the debate that he had with the Maskilim and the Haskola movement and others about having to prove. And it's very different from other parts of Chassidus. Sefer Achira, though we read it and we learn it, there's a much of Chassidus in it, but it's very unique in that particular world. Like similar to the Meir Nevuchim, which the, Alta Reb, the, Rabba, the, the Rambam writes, is for Nevuchim, for the Novach, for a student that was perplexed. Okay, even though we later we've learned that Meir Nevuchim, I mentioned this a few weeks, last week, that Meir Nevuchim, that Alta Rebbe taught 
the, the, his, his children and the Tzamech Tzedek, Biyurim in Meir Nevuchim, Api Chsidis. But initially, that was its purpose. So it's a good question. So why Takech Chsidis doesn't involve itself with proofs? Rarely. I mean, you'll have sometimes expression, Ein Dover Eis Asatzmei, something doesn't create itself, but it's not involved in lengthy proofs. Sometimes a Maimur will talk about the Hizbonus, how a person's misbein and contemplates on the Creator, the being that you can't have existence without a Creator and so on, but not in the same way that you have in the Chikira. So the question really is, is Chikira Chikira? How do we translate Chikira? Chikira literally means to uh, probe. Chikira could also mean Sifre Chikira, philosophical. Right in the beginning of Teter Shalom, the Rebbe Rashab gives a slap to a student who's learning Mary Nevochim. He says, it's not, you know, what are Tomim not to learn Chikira. Well, it wasn't Tem Chitmim yet then. It's Tom Beis, I believe. But, so Chsidis is considered to be Divrei Elikim Chaim. Now you could ask a better question. What about Teter itself? Teter Shebik Sav. It begins with an axiom. Breshi is Bora Elikim Shashemayim Vesodetz. No proof. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth and just assumes that's how it is. Nowhere in Chumash are you going to find a proof for God's existence. Even when a uh, party says, I don't know this God of yours. There's proofs through them, of the miracles. But you don't find philosophical proofs in Teir Shabbat Ksav. Teir Shabbat either. It's only in later generations. The Ge'enim and the generations after that. The real reason is the following. First of all, that's a few points. Number one is, can you really bring an absolute proof in a world that God created in an agnostic fashion? Especially after the Chiddush of the Arizal with the Tzimtzum, Arishan, God concealed His presence. And the Gemara says, Very strange Gemara. Moshe Rabbeinu is learning Chumash and says, We shall create man in our image, in our, light, in our, in, in, uh, in, in our image and our likeness. Now who's we? So Moshe says to Hashem, this will allow an interpretation for Minim, for Apikursim, for apostates to say there's a we, there's a duality. And you know what Hashem answers? Those that want to make a mistake will make a mistake. Why would you do that? Why would you say something that could lead to a mistake? Even without Moshe's question. The answer is, because what he's really saying is, that's I'm creating the world in a way where a person can make a mistake. That's the whole purpose of the concealment. That we should be wise to understand it's only a concealment. So that, first of all, that concept itself, therefore, absolute proofs. Yes, there are logical proofs, and there are many proofs, but it's easy to deny them because God made it in a way that we have this dissonance, cognitive or emotional dissonance, to deny it. You can believe, and the faith does not impermeate you. You can be a thief that prays to God to succeed. Number two, chsidis is not involving in this premise, in the premise, in the act. Of, of having to delve itself into proofs which can go on forever and ever. Chassidus is coming to transform our lives. It's a lakus. And every system needs an axiom. Chassidus assumes that a person is in a spiritual search, assumes that we already know that there's a divine presence, and how, how do you build a relationship with that? And number three, which may be extension of number two, is experiential. Chassidus is experiential, means experience. You experience God through living that way, through serving, through committing, through actions, not through sitting and contemplating, do I believe or don't I believe, which can be an endless exercise, as I said, and maybe even futile because of all the different abilities of Yitzhah. We all have a Yitzhah. You see, this is something much more on a platter. Here is an p- approach to life, a methodology, a divine methodology. Live it. Tamuru'u, kitev Hashem, kitev havaye. Taste it and you'll see. It would be like going and starting to the whole proof, does music touch us? The answer is listen to music and you'll find out. So there are svarim chikira that have a purpose of teaching us whether music touches us or doesn't touch us and they analyze it in philosophical, for those that may need that. But if you really want to experience music, just do it. You want to swim? Jump into the waters and swim. This is the experience of God more than the chikira, whether there is a God, whether there is not. The classic story of the chassid, the non-chassid, the chassid said, you know, you think about yourself, he was debating someone about God, you think about God all the time, I think about myself all the time, and later he came to find out that that was actually an insult. You think about God all the time because you know you exist. And your question, does God exist? Maybe, maybe he exists, why, when? I think about myself all the time because I know God exists, that's a given. 
My question is why, why, whether I exist in the face of a God. And if yes, why? And is it real? And what's the purpose? That's a very different, that's called really experiencing swimming the waters, the divine waters. Like the waters that the knowledge that fills, like the water that fills the sea. That's the brief response. I have not seen it befetish written by the Rebbe or elsewhere. So Lake Tzach Bamir, as they say. But I'm open to hearing any commentary on this if anybody has additional things to say, different things, or if you actually have sources that talk about this. I've not seen it directly, but in answering the question, I believe this is the way it is. And it's the best way, Tamar Kitev Hashem, like the Alta Rebbe in Shklov, all the taters, at the end of the day, singing us a nigan. Tamar the Rebbe Tav Shechai, Purim Tav Shechai, Tamar U'u Kitev Havaye, Fazuchten Zet, as the Rebbe Shter is good. And with that, hundreds of people milled and followed him because they felt, they felt it, they experienced it much more than a proven uh, case. Which, like any mathematical equation can be proven, can be disproven. And who wants a God that's a result and a product of a mathematical equation anyway? Even the smartest of us know, do you want a God that's a product of your mind? How brilliant you are. You want a God that's more brilliant than you or beyond brilliance altogether. Which, of course, can be continued this conversation Less machshav machshav eisechem and less machshav etfisa beklal, and other discussions which are, go off already, which are outgrowth of this discussion. Let's do the three essays for this week, which will be the conclusion of last year's essay contest. And the first one is sanctifying our emotional void. Bracha Polter, age twenty. Acton, Massachusetts. I'm always keep being amazed by the ages of the of the contestants, which is tremendous. As many of you may have seen, actually, from this year's contest, a 14 year old girl was posted on the websites a story how she wrote an article, being that the, the requirement was age 15. Why Lama Nagata? Why are we deprived? A beautiful article and essay about Chassidus being relevant to all. You could check it out online. Um, so this Bracha Polter writes. Uh, satisfying our emotional void. She writes, suicide, drugs, alcohol, remedies, of all these negative things that are going on tomorrow, people are experiencing all negative. Why is that these have become the answers to which many in our society turn to? These very sad and and, uh, negative experiences when in need of relief. What are we running from? And what are we trying to reach? Continues on discussing a society of confusion and bringing chsidus to explain how the neshama, the pure and holy neshama, introduces another alternative. That you have an element that the divine purpose that God has given you. It's a nicely written essay, using also the concept of Echad, the Aleph of Hashem, Aluf Shalelem, how it permeates Ches and Dal of the world. And remembering how the significance of a person is not about their experiences, but why God put you here. This essay and all the others can be seen at MyLifeMeaningfulLife.com forward slash Essays. And as I should mention now, it's also an opportunity if you want to write questions, go to meaningfullife.com forward slash my life. Essay number two is Worldly Pleasures in Chassidus, uh, written by Esther Rochel Al Kaim, age 30, Bal Harbor, Florida. This is an essay, a very interesting essay about pleasure. Pleasure touches a person at their deepest core. Kabbalistically, of course, it's higher than the ten spheres. Bringing Kuntur Samayim from the Rebbe Rashab, explaining pleasure in many different forms. And the essential essay is directed toward channeling the drive for pleasure, uh, channeling the drive of pleasure, even of the animal soul, toward the purpose for which God created that pleasure. So again, a very nice essay about that, creating that balance and living up to our privilege. It also addresses the concept of Chabad light, how that's completely not, a, uh, not on the map, uh, this essay puts it, um, in the context of our directing our mission and our goal, our highest calling toward what the Rebbe, toward what Chassidus asks of us. And finally, essay number three, a Hebrew essay, uh, Challenges in the Eye of the Beholder by Menachem Mendel Notik, age 22, Temchet Mimim, Migdala Emek, Kiryat Malachi. So this essay deals with um, the effect of Chassidus on a person's general life, and specifically... A person's um, fears and insecurities. And he takes this in, in an interesting, original way, and, and like in a story form, looks at a person's confidence and lack of confidence, and introduces how this introduces to a person a new way of building that type of inner confidence based on their neshama, 
based on uh, uh, their, their, their journey every day of growing through their betachen, their trust, and their commitment to the divine. So those are the three essays. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the moment that we all have been waiting for, and um, which is the announcement of the winners of this year's My Life Chassidus Applied Essay Contest. 2016, Tavshin Ayin Vav, with the first prize winner winning $10,000, the second prize $3,600, and the third, part, the third place winner would be $1,000. But, as I've said a number of times, I look at it that they're all winners, every one of you who have written essays. The bottom line is, in this Elam Haza, you just can't have hundreds of all winning the first prize. So we had excellent judges who worked pretty hard it was difficult because there were many essays that were very qualified and literally fractions of a point divided from one to the next. I can personally testify to that. All day today, Friday, we're struggling to really get exactly the right, the best type of doing justice in a, subject, in a subjective type of test contest because it's not a black and white yes or no thing. Sometimes one essay is like apples compared to oranges of another essay. So how do you really establish but we had to do the best we can, and hopefully in this world, with all the challenges, we have came up with excellent judges who really, as I said, applied themselves. I want to thank them all. They were posted to judges. There are many other judges that looked through the different rounds of, of judging. And we finally came to here the top 16 uh, marks. The top 16, I'll go from the 16 down to the number one. And, um, and, and uh, may you all celebrate those that uh, are mentioned here. And all the others that are not mentioned, I will be reading these essays as I did last year. Every week a few essays. Because I think that I personally saw essays that were really excellent. And every essay has its strengths. Some essays have different strengths. Others have these strengths. And at the end of the day, it's all subjective. But uh, I don't say that in any uh, defensive way. I say it just simply to be, state the facts as they are. So here we are, the drum roll of the winning essays of this year's My Life this applied essay contest. We'll start with number 16. Hadassah Silberstein, age 23, Brooklyn, New York. Title being, What If I Just Don't Care? Apathy, the Incurable Disease. Number 15. Adam Zagoria Moffat, age 26, Oceanside, New York. Receiver and Responder. Chsidis Chidish on Caregiving. Number 14. A repeat of last year's number one winner, Arya Gorowitz, age 23, Lake Worth, Florida. This year writing on self-control from the essence of your soul. We go to number 13. Rivka Erentrei, age 60, Brooklyn, New York. A Hebrew essay. Mezida Sanasun, Limozer Shel Ava, Vishlemus. Loosely translated, marriage, a platform for love and perfection. Now to number 12. Sashi Gutnik, age 18, North Bondi, Australia. Conquering, I can't. Age 18. Next, number 11. Avremel Vogel, age 24, Brooklyn, New York. A Hasidic take on the four-letter word. Moving to number 10. Ellie Sobel, age 40, Brooklyn, New York. The method to think good so that it will truly be good. Number nine, Mishael Almalem. I hope I pronounced that right. Age 38, Jerusalem, Israel. Another Hebrew essay. Ladas lahakshiv muhus tafkideh shalam ashpia. Hine lahakshiv almanas lechibur lemushpe bimkeme. The role of the mashpia to listen. I know how to listen. The role of the mashpia to listen and relate to the individual. Number eight, Ricky Winner. Age 21, Brooklyn, New York, Encountering You. Number 7, Yeshaya Marantz, age 32, Tzvas, Israel, another Hebrew one, Simcha, Ikarein Havadois, Shepeded Geder. Joy, the principle of certainty which pierces boundaries. Moving along to number 6, we're getting closer to the top winners. Menachem Mendel Fromer, age 16, Haifa, Israel, another Hebrew one. Machshavis Ahipuch, Achsidis. Loosely translated, Hasidic thought transformation. Okay, the top five now. 
Number five, Sholem Ber Krambi, age 30, Jerusalem, Israel, again a Hebrew one. Habenini, Kabbalah Atzmis, Kederech Leripoi Hanefesh Bi'idon HaModerni. The Benini, self acceptance as a way of healing the soul in the modern era. And now, my, my friends, I share with you a unique, we decided something the judges decided literally right before this program to make an exception because it was an excellent essay. Had it not been for its length, would have probably been either number one or number two. But because it's such an excellent essay, and it's just very long, relatively speaking, so we've gave, given it fourth place, but it will have an award, a monetary award of $1,000. So we'll call it the bonus fourth place winner. Levi Liberov, age 26, Brooklyn, New York. The man of faith is lonely no more. Loneliness, fate, or destiny. So this is a special prize that we're giving for this particular essay because of its excellence in the eyes of the judges, but we're being fair to everyone regarding length. That's the only reason we're doing this, but it, we're trying to be both sides of trying to ha- win on both sides of the fence. Number three now. So here are the top three winners. The number third place winner of thousand dollars is Shaul Wolf, age twenty-five, Brooklyn, New York. The soul, a source of inherent self-worth. So now we're coming down to the final two. And with this we will conclude. Number two, second place winner of $3,600. Chaim Heber, age 33, Be'er Sheva, Israel. Eiriz Bekelem, a Hebrew essay. And finally, I wish I had some music or drums, but this is number first place winner of $10,000. Goes to none other than Nechama Dina Handel, age 33, Jerusalem, Israel. Success within reach, life-changing Hasidic tools. Congratulations to all of you. From the top down, maybe I shouldn't even put it that way. I think everybody, as I said, like an eagle, a circle is a winner. But I mean top down from the first place to the second place to the third place. Congratulations. May it be a great uh, entry into Yud Aleph Nissen, an entry into Yud Gimel Nissen, entry into Pesach. And with this, I want to conclude this episode of My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 112, the Koshen and Fredrich and Pesach. Next Sunday night, obviously, will not be a broadcast because of the Yontif, but there will be one Isra Chag in two weeks, and you will hear from us. You can see these essays. They will be posted, uh, so please look out for them. We'd love to hear your feedback. Mazel Tov and congratulations again. It's been a big schus to be able to engage hundreds and hundreds of peop- people of all ages to write these essays, to commit. I personally see the, the investment and I want to commend everyone who's invested with the energy that they put in to write beautiful essays. We will publicize them. Hopefully there'll be a catalyst to create the ripple effect of your futsa minus chutzah and finally being the, the last step necessary to ka'osi marda molka meshicha together with Mashiach Tzidkenu in this month of benisa nigalu, benisa nasidun le'igal, in this month of ge'ula, chedesh ha'ge'ula, together with the Rebbe, together with all the Rabbeim, be'gula amitiz va'ashlema. Thank you very much. Na'kosher and afrelech in Pesach.